Well, good evening, friends. What a joy to be with you tonight and to sing these songs together. I mean, this has been my favorite part of the day. Fantastic. What joyful lyrics and truth fills your soul. Well, I want to turn to the Word of God together, and we're going to go really, really early. Let's go to Genesis 1-1. I want you to go to Genesis 1-1 with me, a single verse tonight. You might even know this one by heart. I bet you do. The Word of God says, and you say it with me, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Everybody you meet is living according to some story. And the Bible has its own story to proclaim, its own narrative to shape hearts and direct lives. But everybody you meet, everyone in your family, everyone in your church, every friend you've ever had, is living according to some accounting of things. They might not have thought it all the way through, but they've got some sense of whether there's meaning, whether they're pursuing something of significance that fills them with some kind of satisfaction. At least that's their goal. You meet people who have a story about why there's something rather than nothing. They look at the world around them and they say, well, the reason this is all here is probably, and they fill in the blank. They even have thoughts about, well, when we die, here's what I think is beyond this life. Some instinct they have, some intuition. Everybody you meet is living according to some story they're telling themselves. We are a storytelling people, and civilizations unearthed through archaeology bear this truth out. For all of these many millennia, we have been telling stories. Now, the question is whether the people we know have any good basis for believing the story they tell themselves. That's quite a different matter, isn't it? If they glean this narrative from movies and books, it's kind of hodgepodging it together. Maybe friends or family have said to them when they were growing up, well, you see, little one, this is what happens when you die, and this is why there's a world. Maybe it's just their own instincts. They're feeling their way through the world, and they're reasoning in the way that they can with their minds, and they say, well, here's what I think. And we need to ask ourselves whether we are seeing our lives in light of the Bible's big story for the world. And God has inspired Genesis through Revelation as the epic of his redemption. And we need to see ourselves in light of this story and tell one another this story because the story we tell ourselves is the one that shapes us. And the Bible has the best story. There's not a narrative you will find in this culture or in ancient civilizations that is supreme over this one. This one is true. We want to tell one another this story and proclaim the Word of God together so that we can worship and follow the one who has made us, who has made the heavens and the earth and all that that implies. So how does the Bible's big story get started? It's really agonizing trying to come up with the right opening line sometimes. And I wonder if putting pen to parchment, the biblical author has ever thought, well, I can't just jump in and start writing. How should I start? The famous book Moby Dick begins with, Call Me Ishmael. A Tale of Two Cities begins with, It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. I love that line. That's a great line. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number 4 Privet Drive were proud to say they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I remember reading a student paper at Boyce College. (laughs) And the opening line was, welcome to my paper. (laughs) And honestly, that's pretty great. That's pretty great. I mean, it was a show of hospitality, honestly, on his part, that I was welcomed to his paper. I appreciated the warmth. Genesis 1-1 begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in our English translations, that's 10 opening words. It's fewer in the original language, seven Hebrew words, seven. It's a perfect opening line, actually. 
And this verse is challenging to us as interpreters because it's very familiar. And so when we come to familiar passages, we realize there are things that are obvious from these verses, this passage, this one verse tonight, these seven words in Hebrew, that uh, because they're familiar, they can escape our notice. Well, my goal with you is to reflect in the next few minutes on the opening words of the Bible. And the Bible, in this most foundational book, is meant to direct our lives, and there's nothing more foundational than Genesis. And you can't get earlier in Genesis than verse 1. So this is, this is so foundational. The foundational verse for everything fo- that follows, this is where it all begins. The verse is a claim. That's observation number one. This verse is a claim. This is not a question. The Bible doesn't open with a conversation. The Bible opens with an assertion, a claim. And here is the opening claim, that all things exist because of a creator. That's the claim the Bible opens with. If we look around and we ask, why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is Genesis 1.1. The claim is about the origin of all things. And the claim is vast. You can't stretch your arms bigger than the heavens and the earth. That just covers everything, doesn't it? You can't stretch wider than those words. Everything that follows verse 1 in the creation account is about this God forming and filling the heavens and the earth. And so that's the assertion, observation number one in this verse. Number two, the subject. The subject. The first subject in the Bible is God. And honestly, it'd be kind of weird if it wasn't, but let's just observe that the first subject in the Bible is God. He's mentioned and is the only subject in the whole verse. God is the first subject, and that's altogether fitting and right because, well, the rest of the Bible helps us realize all things exist for Him. All things exist because of Him. If there is going to be an actor in Genesis 1-1, it is perfectly reasonable that it be God. The Bible is His story. The Bible gives many verbs that God is an actor of over the course of Scripture. God blesses. God loves, God warns, God saves, God promises, God dwells. These subject-verb combos are wonderful. We need all of these statements. The whole host of verbs throughout the Bible are telling us the things God does. But what about the earliest recorded act? Well, the verse is a claim. The first subject is God. And observation number three, the verb. The first verb reported in the whole Bible, a Bible, a story filled with actions, is the verb created. God created the heavens and the earth. So Genesis 1-1 wants you to know something about God, namely that He is the creator. And as creator of all things, this means you and I are part of the all things He has made. From verse 1, a distinction is established between the Creator who is transcendent and glorious and creature. The Creator-Creator distinction is maintained throughout the Bible's storyline. God never becomes less than God, and mankind never becomes more than man. Instead, this distinction is established from verse 1 forward. There is the Creator God, and there is everything else that's not that. The verb created suggests great power. How could it not? The existence of something rather than nothing is the result of immense power. Paul reasons this way. You read Romans chapter 1 verse 20. He's thinking about these acts of creation in Genesis 1. He says in Romans 1 verse 20, for God's invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, And his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. What does Paul believe? He believes that Genesis 1 is directing us to a world that you can perceive truth in in general revelation. That there is a God, so there is the divine nature. 
and that this God is of great power. There's the eternal power that was referenced in Romans 1.20. You can perceive a divine creator of immense power in creation. Now, when the book of Genesis was written, the book of Genesis is part of a series of books that in the days of Moses were given to these Israelites who were delivered out of Egypt. These are sometimes called the books of Moses, the five books of Moses, or the Pentateuch. And Genesis is part of a five-book collection. And the Pentateuch for the Israelites would tell them their history, not only the history they were living out in the days of Moses, as Moses was recording their journeys and the miracles of God and the tragic judgments that would follow, but also what happened before the Israelites were Israel. And the book of Genesis is the pre-Israelite history. And the Israelites had contemporaries, other cultures, other neighboring groups who were also interested in the question, why is there something rather than nothing? They were surrounded by people who had origin stories. Mesopotamia and Babylon and Egypt, these were all places that had stories of how things came to be. Genesis 1-1, however, stands distinct. A a few sub-points about this larger observation about the ancient Near East. This is an ancient Near Eastern claim in Genesis 1-1. How is it different, though, from what other stories would, would say? After all, we have contemporary cultural origin stories, like, well, there was this something out of nothing, an explosion, and over millions and billions of years, all of these random assembling atoms and chemicals resulted in, and then fast forward, here we are. Like, that's the origin story where all of us come from nothing and no one. The Creator, in Genesis 1-1, has in this assertion some differences in the contemporary stories of the days of Moses. First of all, notice that there's one creator in this verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's different from ancient Near Eastern stories. They were polytheistic. There was a plurality of gods, all sorts of gods doing all sorts of things. And in a prominently polytheistic culture, well, Genesis 1-1 shines that there's not many gods. There's one God, One God that should be worshipped, one God who should be praised, one God who has made all things for His glory. There is one God. Among other comparisons in the world in days of Moses, the Creator in verse 1 makes all things from nothing. I wonder if it would surprise you that that's not how other contemporary stories of the day told creation, uh, told the account of creation. Ancient Near Eastern accounts talk about gods making things from other gods, One God kills this God, breaks a God in half, and makes things from it. Or some sort of pre-creation matter or substance. Verse 1 shows the nonsense of that. God makes the heavens and the earth, and He doesn't use anyone or anything to do it. So among the other competing stories and the cultures of the day, Genesis 1-1 says there's one God And from all things, he made, from no thing, he made everything. It's by his word and power that he brings things to pass. The New Testament confirms this. Hebrews 11.3 tells us we're on the right track by reading the Old Testament this way. The writer of Hebrews says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things visible. This is different from the stories the Israelites would have been immersed in in the world of the ancient Near East. One more observation about these A and E comparisons. In Genesis 1-1, God does not create out of any deficiency in Himself. Oh, how crucial is this? You compared this story with others in the ancient Near East What I mean is in Genesis 1-1, God is not bored, He's not needy, He's not lacking in any capacity that would lead Him to create, to try to compensate for something or to meet a need He has. The stories of the days of Moses outside the land of Israel and within the land of Canaan, they told of gods with many needs and gods that needed to create man because the gods were frankly tired of having to uphold everything. And so mankind was to relieve the gods of work and toil, and mankind was viewed with contempt by the gods. Oh, how different Genesis 1 sings as a song into this predicament. 
Genesis 1-1 says there's one creator. He makes all things from nothing, and he does not create out of any self-deficiency. With seven Hebrew words, the biblical author draws us into the world of the biblical authors. The creator of all things is sovereign, and he reigns in unimpeachable majesty and authority. In his book, The End for Which God Created the World, Edward says that the creator is infinite, and that means he has all possible existence, perfection, and excellence. So we do not deny any of those things to God, which would lead him in some way to create out of a deficiency. Instead, he has all perfection and all excellence. We need to realize this so that we don't think wrongly about Genesis 1-1. It's the first verse of the Bible. What a, what a terrible place to start off on the wrong foot. We need to realize that God creates the heavens and the earth not because He needed to, but because He delighted to. That's very different. Those verbs are not the same. He created not because He needed to, but because He delighted to. God created us not because He needed us. God made us that He might give to us Himself. This is the purpose for which you and I exist. God made us that He might give to us Himself. There is nothing greater than God for God to give you than Himself. I remember in my college years coming across several books and and preachers who were a great means of grace in my own life and, and finding a paradigm shifting in my heart that had been brewing for a long time. A shift with a, toward a joyful embrace of the supremacy and majesty of God reigning over all things. It struck me in the years that, that correspond to what you're currently living through, and maybe further schooling beyond you, who knows, but you have these years where this is the kind of paradigm many in your stage in life are awakening to the supremacy and glory of God over all things. And Genesis 1-1 is shouting that. The old catechism asked the right question. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We make another observation about our passage tonight, our verse I feel like I can't say verse one is a passage. I don't know that that qualifies as a passage. You've got to have at least more than one. And we're only looking at the first seven words in Hebrew. So these 10 English words, in the beginning, they start that way. The living God makes all things, and he does so at what is called the beginning. We haven't spoken anything about that. We thought about the subject, and we've thought about the verb, and we've thought about the vastness of the heavens and the earth. But I've intentionally avoided to this point the opening words. God creates at what is called the beginning. The first word in Scripture is a prepositional phrase, in the beginning. But the beginning of all things is not the beginning of God. Some pastors and professors get this question from time to time, especially from skeptics. Oh, if everything that exists needs a creator, who created God? Ha, 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 ha. Sometimes they don't add that last part, but their smirk tells me that's what they're thinking. But that question is not nearly as clever as it sounds. In fact, there's a mistake in it. Christians are not claiming that everything needs a cause. We're just just claiming that everything that has a beginning needs a cause. And that's different. And that's the key. God, by very definition, is uncaused. He has no beginning According to Genesis 1-1, at the beginning of things, God was there. Beginnings were His idea, you see. So when people ask, well, who created God? They're probably, unintentionally, making a mistake in their reasoning. The error is called a category mistake. It's like asking a bachelor, who are you married to? The question doesn't apply because of the definition of what a bachelor is. The Bible's definition of God is the uncreated one. So to say or to insist, but but, but who created God, is a failure to reckon with who we are declaring God to be. He is the one without beginning. So the question is irrelevant to His existence. 
He's the uncaused cause. He's the unmoved mover. He is without beginning and without end. He is the eternal God with an eternally divine nature and eternal power. But the word beginning is important. While God does not have a beginning, He makes one. And in the beginning, He creates the heavens and the earth. And just like any great story, a beginning is heading somewhere. Every author starts a book at its beginning to eventually, God willing, reach an end. And this is a grand story, the epic of the ages, where the beginning is heading somewhere. There is a direction. There is a goal And you have to have the whole of the rest of the Bible to tease all of that out, don't you? But this is where it starts. This is where it all begins. Verse 1 tells us things have been made and they're going somewhere. The beginning is aiming at an ending, let's say. And that means we don't live in a world of aimlessness. We live in a world electrified with purpose. Life is meaningful. Your, Your life matters. There is purpose to our existence, and the reason goes back to Genesis 1.1. Verse 1 of the Scripture establishes a meaningful world. How do we know there's meaning in life? Because of Genesis 1.1, that the God who makes a beginning of things is aiming toward an ending that He will accomplish by His sovereign timing and purposes and power. We live in a culture starving for significance. People desperate for identity and meaning. Verse 1 is a banner over our lives because verse 1 tells us we are not our own and we're not on our own either. We belong to the Lord of heaven and earth and everything we pursue and learn about in this life is based on the meaningful world God has made in the first 10 English words of our translation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything flows out of this. All of history flows out of this verse. All the empires that rise and fall flow out of this verse. All of the covenants God makes, all the types and shadows in the Old Testament, all the hopes and dreams of everybody that's ever lived, all the journeys of every person who ever walked this earth, it all flows out of Genesis 1-1. You and I are no exception. It's because of Genesis 1-1 that we're right here tonight in this lovely chapel. Everything flows out of Genesis 1-1, including everything you learn. Without Genesis 1-1, there would be no systematic theology. There would be no church history. There would be no business and marketing. There would be no missions and evangelism. No philosophy, no music, no ethics, no biblical theology, no languages, no math or science or literature. When I say everything flows out of Genesis 1-1, I'm not exaggerating. It's quite literally everything that follows. Everyone and everything is under the authority of the sovereign creator. And in Psalm 24, we know we're reasoning correctly. Psalm 24, one says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. Why, we ask. The psalmist says, oh, I'll tell you, I'm not done. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. So what belongs to the Lord is anything he has made, and well, that's everything. In other words, he's the owner because he is the maker. But Genesis 1 is followed by a story of things that have gone wrong in God's world from chapter 3 forward. And what about the problem of sin and death? Genesis 1-1 may be the beginning of all things, but this story God is telling incorporates a fall and human rebellion. The unfolding story takes you from Genesis 1-1 forward for this glorious good news, that your Creator will be your Redeemer. That's the good news of the story to come, that He has made all things and He is coming to redeem them. The problem of sin will not be an eternal problem. This unfolding story is that the Creator will be our Redeemer, and in order to tell that story, let's look at a different verse 1. New Testament this time. John 1, verse 1, which starts, interestingly enough, with the following words. In the beginning, and now you notice exactly what John is doing here. John intends 
that you start reading his gospel and think of it in light of the Old Testament. We're meant to recall Genesis 1-1 where God displayed his power and his majesty in creating the heavens and the earth. In John 1-1, we are ready to read the story of how our creator is our redeemer in Christ. And if Genesis 1 tells about creation and about the general revelation in the world, John 1 is about the coming of the Son of God, the special revelation of his Son, the incarnation, truly divine and truly man, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that's been made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Oh, that we would be amazed by and awestruck by the supremacy of God's power and the beauty of His saving plan. John 1.14 says, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here is the one in human history for whom all things were made. The Son of God has come for us because God loved the heavens and the earth that he made. He made them and he loved them. And for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So the Lord Jesus becomes flesh and dwells among us. He lives without sin. He dies on the cross with our sin counted to him on his head. He dies declaring it is finished, a death of victory, and on the third day rises in glory. He leaves a hollow tomb. He just needed it for a few days. Death has been overcome, and weeks later he ascends in glory where he reigns now over all things in the heavens and the earth. He reigns with unrivaled power and majesty, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. The end of the book of Revelation, that's where Genesis 1-1 is pointing. This is the ending that the beginning is aiming at. He shall come again to judge the living and the dead, and Revelation tells us of the redemption, the consummation, the fulfillment, the transformation, creation flooded with the shalom of God, everlasting, blessing and joy for God and His people. We shall be His people, and He shall be our God, and we shall ever dwell with Him. Indeed, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Revelation 21.1 says, there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, the Genesis 1-1 situation, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. That is what Genesis 1-1 is aiming at, a story where the goal for all things is summed up in Christ for the glory of God evermore. This is the story in which we live. This is the story to give your whole life to and to proclaim to the nations. This is the story to study with all your heart and might. This is the story to sing and to pray in light of and to come to the Lord praying that these truths would shape and guide your young lives until the glorious resurrection of the dead. One of my friends likes to say, in the beginning... God made all new things, but at the end, He will make all things new. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank You for Your plan that in making all things, You have put into motion a story where Your glorious mercy and redeeming grace is the good news of the gospel. And then in Genesis 1-1, this is where it all starts. Help us, O Father, in this foundational verse with its claims and connections across your word to stir within us the joy of what it is to be made in your image, to be redeemed by the Lord Jesus upon a cross, and to be united to a risen Christ who reigns with all power in heaven and earth. What a great hope we have. May this hope, Lord, uphold us in these days to come. In Christ's name we pray, amen.